Okay, so I guess we're going to start off this panel by a big welcome to everybody. Thanks again for joining us today. Really looking forward to the session and the information that you're going to be providing. Um, I guess I got a first question here for Laura Dwyer um, of Grieg NL. And, and maybe before you answer, Laura, if you could just, uh, I guess, introduce yourself a little bit and, and tell us a little bit about who you are, that would be great. Um, so the question is the following. So advances in technology and in the aquaculture sector in particular, which is obviously a space that you guys are in, are generating more data than ever before and can contribute to safer, more sustainable and more productive operations. How is Greek's how is Grieg NL utilizing innovative approaches in data collection and analysis as a part of your operations? Thank you, Susan. Um, my name is Laura Dewar. I'm the uh, research and development manager here at Grieg Seafood Newfoundland. Um, I've been working with Grieg since 2016, um, developing the Marystown project. So we're, uh, we're finally um, in the midst of construction and production, which is uh, great to see. But to, uh, to answer your question, um, so as a part of our operations here in Marystown, we wanted to create a system that would include connectivity of, of all our areas of operation. So our land-based facilities, um, our sea sites, the processing plants, right through to market. So it would give the customers um, you know, that traceability, they could see, you know, where the fish came from, the grow out phase, you know, where they were in the water, where they were processed. So it's, it's currently a project that we are working on um, with several other um, companies, both aquaculture based and uh, from, from different sectors. Um, we, our main goal is to connect um, all of our systems and all of our uh, measurable parameters, um, compile them into one data hub where all this information can be accessed. So it'll give us an opportunity to um, use real-time um, analytics and uh, data processing. So it'll give you um, better, you know, decision making. Um, so if there's, you know, a, a, a storm coming, you can prepare and, and get, you know, your crews out there, you get, you know, extra equipment out there, um, enhanced communications throughout Placentia Bay. So I don't know if everyone is familiar, but it's, it's a very large area with little um, communication infrastructure right now. So we'd like to enhance the communication infrastructure. It'll increase safety in our operations. Um, and then from all this information that we're going to be collecting, uh, especially all the environmental information, we're going to uh, publicly make that available so different industries can use it, um, educational institutions. Placentia Bay is a really unstudied area. It's, it's like I said, a quite a large area, but there hasn't been a lot of work done. Um, so all the information that we're collecting will be uh, publicly available. Um, our, our network that we're producing, um, it'll allow uh, fishermen in the bay, small communities that are in range in the bay, they'll be able to tap in and, and use our network. Um, the processing plants will be able to get real-time um, stock information before, you know, fish are even delivered to sites. And marketing suppliers, they'll be able to work with the processing plants to, you know, to forecast how much product is coming in, um, when it's going to be available. So for us, our, our main goal is to make, you know, the aquaculture industry a, a complete package um, so that everyone can be on the same page, have access to the same information, um, as well as make it uh, available for the public. Great. Sorry, did I jump in too quick there? Nope. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I mean, I guess speaking personally, when you hear about what's going on in Placentia Bay and the fact that you've almost got this, um, I don't know, this this real marriage between a, a really substantial commercial opportunity, right, in terms of the development project and overarchingly what it's doing, um, mm -hmm. but this 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 significant commitment, right, to to share data on a pretty massive scale with the community. So it's a it's almost a tribute to the fact that these types of things can work, um, and but there's a lot to it, obviously, and, and you guys have been at this for a while now, putting together the strategy around this, so uh, really significant, um, hopefully a really significant opportunity for quite a few people in terms of, of, of new opportunities to access data. I agree, I hope so too. Yeah, 
Okay, um, I guess the next question I've got here is for Julie Angus of Open Ocean Robotics. Hi, Julie, again, nice to see you. Um, so uh, I guess uh, diving in here, your organization collects and provides access to data that supports a wide range of sectors and challenges from illegal fishing to more efficient shipping to safer operations in the Arctic waters. With ocean technology initiatives like OSC driving larger amounts of data on our oceans, what do you see are some key areas data users would need to focus on to take advantage of this flood of available data so that it can be accessed for more informed decision making to address challenges? Yeah, pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you for that question, Susan. So uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Open Ocean Robotics. We're a Victoria, BC based company that's developed uncrewed surface vehicles, um, also known as USVs or um, remotely operated surface vehicles or autonomous boats, um, basically robot boats that go out on the ocean and can collect a range of uh, information using um, variety of of oceanographic and environmental sensors. Um, so our technology has applications in a number of different areas, but where we have been active in, in doing pilots is in um, maritime situational awareness, specifically related to uh, detecting and enforcing against illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing in sensitive ecosystems such as marine protected areas, and also in uh, marine mammal monitoring, um, working uh, uh, on, on a project for the offshore wind industry in detecting North Atlantic right whales, um, which is of course extremely important for the operation of, of these facilities. So, so for us, ocean data, um, the collection of it, the analysis of it, the fusion of it, and, and the providing of it to, to end users is, is extremely important. And, um, you know, I certainly see uh, a lot of opportunities for companies like us to take advantage of uh, available data so that we can advance the analytics um, that we provide to our customers. So we have the data that we collect ourselves, which we can um, do analytics on, but then being able to fuse that with a larger data set. Um, so data that is, is publicly available, perhaps data that is, can be purchased purchased is, is also extremely valuable so that we can draw additional uh, insights, provide additional value. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the challenges is that there, there is a lot of uh, data and ensuring that you determine what is the correct data um, uh, to use um, so that you're serving a purpose. So, so for us, it's very end user focused, you know, what information does our customer need to be able to make better informed decisions that will advance their operations, you know, whether it's more um, safe use, uh, more environmentally sustainable, um, increased affordability. Um, so, so it's really determining what data streams are valuable. Um, and I think, you know, other important factors is being able to um, have the data available in a, a consistent uh, in, in interoperable format so that we're able to, um, you know, look at data across different geographic regions, across different sensors, and be able to um, compare and, and contrast it easily. Um, I also think it's, you know, interesting that the shift to, to data as a service that the Ocean Supercluster is seeing in its companies and on a global scale as well, and that that does offer, um, you know, opportunities for perhaps additional uh, data being added to that which is publicly available or can be shared. So, for example, with, with our USVs, you know, depending on the purpose that they're serving, some of that data can be proprietary only specific to the uh, end user, whereas other data could be um, used for um, additional uh, sort of insights, whether it's in an aggregate format or, or otherwise. So, um, you know, I certainly feel that it's, it's a really exciting time we're in right now and that the potential to be able to use and share ocean data is, is going to advance many, many applications, certainly in our industry. So thank you. 
Yeah, and maybe I'll just pile on there because you know we one of the one of the cool things about this gig is you get to hear a little bit about how people are thinking about taking the future of their business, and this this seems to be, um, you know, something that's come up not quite a bit, but like you know a number of times in so far as uh, you know, people have. Uh, they have a, they have an offering, right? A commercial offering that they're ma they're making money off of data at the end of the day, um, and but you know there's the real revolution out there in terms of becoming more open with with environmental data in particular, um, and people are actively thinking about okay, well if this is where the direction of the of 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 the ocean is going, what is it about my current business model that I can think about differently or that I can tweak to be able to either deliver more value to my customers or to not you know, get put out of business, right? But in some ways, they're not too much different from each other. Um, but this is something that, you know, num num numerous companies are actively trying to think through in the context of potentially even the CUSE platform, right? I mean, it's just, it's a natural question that comes to mind, um, which I think you, you know, addressed uh, in some of your comments. So just, I guess, piling on there a bit on that from, from what I've heard. Any other comments from any other members on the, uh, on the panel? Anyone want to pile on to? Yeah, just to reemphasize what you said there, Susan, I think that's so important. And, you know, for, for companies like us, so much of the focus is on data and the analytics that we're providing. So although we are a hardware company, we're really a software company, and that's where there is so much value. So, you know, in, in the initiatives of the Ocean Supercluster and, and companies as a whole, being able to develop that component of uh, industry within Canada, I think is very valuable in allowing us to compete and excel on a global scale yeah and there's lots of questions around just the data as, as a service uh, model i mean it's not an easy one in some ways either uh to get up and running and to be sustainable because data gets old um okay um i guess we'll move on to terry here from wood now so i've got a question lined up for you too uh so wood dig digitally manages huge amounts of data from a wide range of sources both nationally and internationally can you provide us with some examples of the types of decision support tools you're able to develop for your clients using Wood's information pipeline? And how does greater data access, how does greater access to data strengthen the validity and accuracy of models, forecasts, and visualization that your organization develops? And also, if you could uh, say hi and introduce yourself, that'd be great. Okay. Uh... Thanks, Susan. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Terry Bullock, uh, principal with Wood Consulting. I've been a, a, a marine meteorologist working in Newfoundland and Labrador for 35 years. Over that time, I've been a consultant to the offshore oil and gas industry and also have done a lot of work in the road and aviation transportation sector and, and to the, uh, the energy sector. So I'm the, uh, the technical and business lead for Wood's commercial marine meteorology and oceanogra oceanography or med ocean forecasting business and I represent uh, MedOcean services within Wood globally. So Wood has got something like 40,000 employees. So um, a little known fact is that Wood has the largest private sector weather forecasting company in Canada. We have a national footprint and a growing international business. Um, so to describe your question is it's, you know, it's, it's a hard answer because of the, you know, what we do is forecasting. Uh, weather forecasting and oceanographic forecasting is very complicated. We, uh, we utilize data from um, a number of sources, so international cooperation in those areas is, uh, is outstanding. There's literally terabytes of weather observations and oceanographic observations that come into our facility um, on a daily basis, uh, huge volumes of um, you know, modeling information, satellite data, radar data. Um, there's a number of um, uh, like uh, intelligent uh, sensors and systems such as uh, like uh, salt uh, detection and curing systems and so on that, that all feed into our system. We invested in a cloud-based uh, solution beginning around 10 years ago. And you know we, we utilize uh, you know polling systems and high performance computing and so on on that uh, on that cloud environment, and it's uh, you know it was the way for us to to uh, you know grow and to you know without having to 
uh, completely, you know, replace uh, servers and so on on a regular basis. We just, you know, fire up virtual servers as we need them. Um, we have also invested a lot in visualization tools and data management tools. We, we, for forecasting, we use a system that was developed by Unidata in the, in the US. It's used nationally by NOAA for producing forecasting. And we've adapted that to uh, Canada and international applications. We've done a lot of work in uh, satellite-based uh, analytics. Um, you know, more and more government agencies are putting huge volumes of satellite data on in cloud environments that uh, allows us to access it a lot more readily than we were in the past. We monitor data from hundreds uh, of stations across the country, um, including the marine environment where we, you know, access buoys and ship-based instruments and offshore oil installation-based sensors. Um, you know, what we do, uh, pretty much everything we do is geared around um, um, you know, decision support tools. All the weather forecasts are adapted to our clients' needs. So we really invest in understanding our clients' businesses. Uh, that allows us to, to give them information that you know, they can use to base their decisions on. The uh, you know, latest thing that we've been working on over the past few years is a risk um, uh, calculation and visualization system. It's called the Decision View Risk Dashboard. So what we do is we calculate the risks that various uh, environmental thresholds will be exceeded. It doesn't have to be environmental, but it can be, you know, also uh, any sort of threshold that uh, is relevant to our client's operation. Um, you know, so for example, we can indicate to our clients when the uh, you know, there's more than say a 70% chance that seas are gonna exceed 10 meters. And, and you know, uh, our company's response plans are often based on thresholds and it boils the information down very, um, you know, to very highly, uh, you know, easy to interpret um, decision support product that, uh, that they can use. Anyway. I guess that's yeah. enough to get started. I, I, yeah, no, that's great. I, I, I've got a quick, I have a quick question. Um, so like in, in thinking ahead as to, you know, what CUs could potentially be down the road where you might have multiple, many, um, even industry players kind of contributing data to the platform and knowing how you currently do business now and the data sets that you're working with, if, if you could imagine kind of a situation where you had that happening, you know, to a much larger scale than what exists right now, um, like either what, what would you see in terms of the opportunities for your business or what would you see as, as I guess some of possibly even some of the concerns with, with, with using that type of data or, or what it would unlock or what you would, what you would be thinking about if that was happening in terms of, of how you may or may not use it to, to run your business. Well, even though we have, literally terabytes of data coming in every, you know, every day. Yeah. There's certainly not enough data for us to, to do the job that we want to do, uh, particularly over the ocean. So there is, you know, still a um, relatively data sparse environment that we work in. So what we see as the, you know, the big game changer for the future is satellite based systems and remote, sen uh, remote sensing systems. The cost of deploying, uh, you know, in situ buoys everywhere, is probably um, you know excessive in terms of being able to cover the, the size of the Western Atlantic. So we're looking at satellite-based data. There's been a number of new satellites, um, you know, polar orbiting satellites that have come on stream, like the RadarSat constellation, that are really opening up uh, opportunities for us to you know, to map the current conditions uh, much better than what we've been able to do in, in the past or historically. So it's, uh, you know, these uh, systems tend to be very complicated to access and use and to, uh, you know, in order to make sure that the data that we're accessing actually contributes to more accurate forecasting information and more better decisions, you know, that, that doesn't just happen automatically. That uh, can be yeah. quite, uh, 
you know, a lot of effort and research to, to make that happen. And using satellites has to be, you know, uh, the data from the satellites has to be validated against uh, data with no quantity of you know, accuracy and so on. I'd also like to see remote sensing data deployed on like offshore. So there are things like, uh, you know, LIDAR and uh, atmospheric profilers that can, uh, can monitor quite large, uh, you know, sections of the atmosphere, the bottom section of the atmosphere that can contribute to, you know, forecast accuracy. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, you know, but it, you know, just throwing data out there doesn't mean that um, yeah. decisions are going to be based on on better guidance. You really have to think that through and and uh, validate the work that you do and make sure that your forecasting, if that's your you know that's your challenge, is is improving over time. Yeah, great, thanks, James. I saw you nodding your head there a bit. I don't know if you wanted to pile on at all. I know you haven't been introed yet, but if you've had anything to say, go for it. Sure, S Susan. I was just agreeing with, with the, the the need for remote sensing is where we're going to be going. We talk about the volumes of data we've been dealing with, and and buoys are important, but that's just a trickle compared to the amount of remote sensing and and other data assimilated model data that's coming online and becomes available. There's there's a lot of data coming down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, yeah, the buoys, buoys are still are important, important to, to validate uh, the remote sensing data and also the, the model data. You know, so you know, we, we, we need more of those in, in strategic locations, but we're not going to ever have enough of those to really represent what's, what's happening at any point in time. Got it. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to move on to Joel now. Um, hello, welcome. So the question I have for you is, uh, sorry, Jill Clean us from Force, and I'll ask you to give yourself a brief introduction when you come on here. Uh, so my question for you is this, in uh, creating a comprehensive picture of the marine environment, what tools does Force use to visualize multiple ocean uses and characteristics in order to advance tidal stream energy projects? Uh, thank you, Susan. Yeah, so I'm Joel Kalina, an oceanographer with uh, Fundy Ocean Research Center for Energy. We're, uh, we're based in Halifax and have our, our principal site in uh, Parsboro, Nova Scotia, on the Bay of Fundy. Um, so just, just to give a two-line spiel about FORCE, uh, FORCE is a not-for-profit organization with understanding if tidal power can be harnessed safely and reliably in the Bay of Fundy. Uh, Forest Research tests and validates marine renewable technology and monitors its effect on the environment. Um, so, so, so up at our site in Parthville, we have like uh, we have infrastructure, substation, uh, connection to the grid. Uh, there's a visitor center which kind of doubles as a research station, and um, we uh, but we also do extensive environmental monitoring, site characterization, and environmental monitoring. Um, Okay, so, so to get to the question, um, like what tools do we have for visualization? Um, maybe the, 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 the honest answer is, is not, not much. <laughs> um, visualization is a, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. And as the previous speaker, Terry, was, was alluding to there, just uh, um, especially when you get into uh, like three spatial dimensions, uh, as we do with some of our tools, like we have, our site is fair, fairly, our principal site is fairly geographically limited. So we have uh, onshore like X-Man radar, for instance, that's, um, that, that maps the area, uh, provides us with, with the wave field from which we can extract uh, currents and we can also extract eddies. But um, visualization of this is, 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 a, is to me, is, is, is one of the huge, um, is one of the first order problems with how do we how do we convert data into information? Uh, we do have a, a online GIS type tool that does some standard GIS type things like um, uh, <coughs> uh, uploading various shape files, um, you know, overlaying them and determining you know good areas with respect to whatever metric. Um, <coughs> it, um, but uh, just thinking in terms of 
what we would like to see, like say from CUSE, and um, we, we would like to see something where where we could where we could display our our well something like a GIS type tool. Um, everyone seems to do their own GIS thing, but but if uh, like if CUSE for instance could have like a a uh, like a, a GIS type tool that can do the standard things, which is really just two dimensional, like overlaying and all that, that would be tremendously helpful. Um, because our, our site, again, it's it's fairly geographically limited and we're gonna have like a lot of turbine manufacturers coming, coming in. Uh, it's like one, one kilometer by one kilometer or so. Um, and each of these turbines generate wakes. These are three dimensional wakes. Um, so really, we we do need we need we, we need to get beyond even the, the traditional two there two, two dimensional uh, visualization you know layers. We need to get to three dimensions. But I'd say like like two things we, we really want to accomplish is is just to is to get like access to the sorts of tools that we can where we can do the two dimensional layering, but also work towards uh, visualization in three dimensions, which is practically what we're what we need to do at our like practically things are three dimensional in the ocean and it's that's it, it's a huge challenge but um yeah it, pra in practice we, we we need to get to um three dimensional visualization um, so um and, and just to give one concrete example like we're right now doing a, a project on encounter risk modeling with respect to fish, uh, like modeling how fish might interact with turbines. Uh, this requires like 40, well, three spatial dimensions in time characterization of flow. And it's going to be related to 4D fish fields that are collected from um, 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 fish tag receivers. Um, so, so right now we're in the midst of this, this project where we're dealing with three dimensions um, and, and and we're facing the, the very difficult task of how do we relate this or, or how do we visualize this three and four dimensional data. Um, so yeah, just to summarize, there's really, um, we, we, we really like to have like just sort of standardized tools for, uh, for doing the 2D, 2D layering, but we also need to work towards uh, three dimensional visualization. Great, thanks. Does anybody else on the panel have um, any other comments kind of in relation to what Joel just spoke about? Good for now. Okay, I'll uh, move on to James. Hi, James. Welcome. Welcome again, I should say. No problem. Uh, so, yeah, great. Right. So the uh, question I have for you is uh, around you know, your work focusing on climate ocean modeling and the development of software for analyzing large model outputs from high resolution ocean data. How are initiatives like Ocean Navigator and CU supporting the development of visualizations tools for big data oceanography? And obviously, if you could take a minute to introduce yourself, that would be great too. Thanks. Sure. Thanks very much, Susan. So, so I'm a professor in physics and physical oceanography at Memorial University. My, my broad research area is in big data oceanography in the sense of trying to help people get to their science faster. And so that includes training students with new technologies, innovating in different software designs. Um, I've done a lot of work building data services and data pipelines in terms of trying to figure out the middleware of how to get that data. And, and often it's in an academic uh, context, but a lot of it's applicable to, to industry as, as, as well. Um, so my various hats I wear is, is I'm, I'm part of CUSE Atlantic as one of the, the co-investigators on that project. I'm also a, a collaborator with Department of Fisheries and Oceans on their Ocean Navigator suite as a way of getting uh, model data and operational forecast data out to developers. And so I, I wear this hat as an academic and a developer and a data engineer. Um, to, to me, the, the, the biggest sort of tidal wave coming down, and I spoke to this early, earlier, is just the sheer volume of, of data. I, I totally agree with Terry. We always need more buoy data or float data, but, but we, we are going in oceanography from a data poor field to a data rich field. Um, you talk about the, the, the floodgates opening of data. Um, remote sensing, if you just look at the amount of data that's going to be coming out of these platforms, um, you're talking data sets, which are, which are tens of hundreds of petabytes of remote sensing data, not all of it oceanographic, but just that's the scale. And then when you talk about um, model data, so in model data, of course, is that really data? So I'm thinking 
uh, data assimilated products, right? So you, you, you have the, the boy data has been assimilated into these large model data sets and you wanna get your hands on that. Um, as uh, uh, Terry from Wood was, was talking about, to be able to work with that data, you either need to build an infrastructure that can handle several tens of terabytes coming in every day, hundreds of terabytes, few petabyte data sets, or well, what do you do? Um, and so this is where, where tools like CUS and, and, and uh, Ocean Navigator come in, is, is they provide a way for, for everyone else. And whether or not that's a graduate student, a researcher, a smaller fisher, a, a, a company new to the area, to access these vast amounts of data without having to first locally have a copy of it. So if a historic model for getting oceanographic data was to go through some plan of discovery, download it locally and then analyze. That's that's a model and that would work just fine for like a CTD cast or some boy data where I can imagine putting all my data on a, on a floppy disk or on a CD or a USB key. But when the data volume per day is multiple terabytes, you can't have step one be download the data. So the, the big innovation is, is, as Terry talked about, the, the switch to the cloud, right? So rather than bring your data locally to you, you bring your analysis to wherever the data happens to be located. You leave it in situ. If it's a remote dating set, you bring that processing to wherever the data is. If you're doing a, a visualization of um, some model output, you bring whatever the calculation you want to that, the, where the data happens to be. So in Ocean Navigator, what it is is a platform where, yes, we, we redistribute model data, but the real feature is being able to do some of those second order calculations, some of those reductions on the data on the server side. That's, that's where the, the power of this, of this comes from. Um, so there's a number of new technologies out there which are, are allowing you to do these very large scale data reductions and they're leveraging the cloud, but not so much as cloud as in you have to spin up a virtual service and a virtual machine in someone's cloud. You're really taking advantage of data as a service for, for model data, for remote sensing data and, and other products. Um, the other thing that things like uh, CU is, is getting to, and I'll just build on what Joel had talked about, um, so Force was talking about the fact that currently they work with 2D data, they're, they're trying to work within 3D data, and you know what, it's going to be really hard when we get to the four-dimensional data, because that'll have time as well. Well, when we start talking about um, multi-ensemble forecast data, so this is both operational oceanography, but also season-to-season -season scale climate forecasting, you're actually dealing with five dimensions, because you'll actually have current time and lead time, two time dimensions. And now we're talking, and then you talk about ensembles, right? The reality is we'll never know the state of the ocean perfectly. So one way to achieve that is you don't run a ocean model, you run 96 ocean models. And now you have another dimension, which is the space of all possible futures. And we haven't got to multi-model ensembles yet. Um, so, so that question of how you do those very large reductions. And so what these tools like Ocean Navigator and CUs do is they provide some common framework, consistent plat, uh, uh, consistent formats, and common web services and services that you can build tools and reductions on top of. Um, and and for me, that's where I'm seeing that the, the future of this this field is is building those things as opposed to having to. I said you don't start by downloading the data locally and then using it. You, you tap in, you build services on top on top of services. Great. Anyone else on the panel want to uh, pile on on that in any way? We got about five minutes left before the uh, we'll go to Q&A. So just pause there for a second. Okay, well, I've got one I'm going to hit you all up with to see um, what kind of reaction you get. So um, I took a look at the attendee list for the event that we have here today, and we've got a number of government reps, uh, nonprofit reps, um, but the vast majority of the uh, of the industry participants that are here today are from uh, SMEs, so companies that are 100 employees or less. And I'm thinking about kind of being in their position, listening to what we're, what, you know, what, what's come across um, through this panel and in the series, and knowing that we're going into a breakout session where we're going to be asking them 
um, you know, to explore approaches for using tools and visualizations to su support decisions and, and, you know, why they would contribute to that from a data exchange standpoint. Um, and, you know, and some of the original kind of takeaways from the first session were just around, um, you know, so, some, some concerns, I guess, and some questions around, um, you know, why would I do that? You know, I'm still trying to, you know, operate my business and to make money. Um, you know, there's there's an inherent value proposition to the CU's platform for lots of stakeholders because of the business that they're in or the work that they do. Um, but, uh, you know, if I was an SME um, and I'm thinking about, you know, interacting with the CU's platform, um, you know, is there, I guess, anything you guys can offer in terms of um, you know, the why and the rationale and the how, and, and more specifically, you know, what types of, um, what types of supports we could potentially have in place for people that would want to undertake, you know, that kind of engagement with the platform. I know it's a relatively loaded question, but um, thought maybe uh, this panel might be able to contribute to that either from their own perspective and kind of what the value proposition is for them and their understanding of that from conversations they might have had with SMEs or being an SME. Um, with the last couple of minutes, given the fact that we've got that next on the agenda, I wanted to just quiz this panel to see if they've got any insight. Can I jump in there, uh, Susan, real quickly, yeah. just to sort of tie in in terms of I was talking about models and the importance of models. And I think Terry alluded to this, that the models are limited by the amount of data you have. And so whenever there's an actual in situ observation that helps improve the quality of those those model data, which hopefully these small and medium enterprises are, are using in their operations. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the value proposition, I, I understand that sometimes real time or near real time data, there might be a hesitancy going, well, if I let the world know what I know today right now, that could be a problem. Um, however, when you're talking about people who design these models and work in these models, even delayed mode information, and I'm talking months or even years delayed, has, has value, right? So even though the data operationally may no longer be useful to you, recording the metadata and getting in an organization like CIUS can let us build better modeling tools so hopefully you can take advantage of those future products. So that, that long history of data is, is critical. Great. Thanks. And maybe as we're quizzing the rest of the panel, if anyone's got any uh, questions, uh, written questions now before we head into the breakout sessions that you want to ask this panel, please put them in the chat. And maybe I'll come back around the panel here to see if there's any other comments. Co Terry, I know you're off mute, so you might want to say something there. Well, I'm just thinking that there are opportunities to, to do business now that didn't exist even five years ago. You know, there are marketplaces available on like the uh, Microsoft Azure's cloud on the Amazon cloud, that gives you um, pretty much, you know, instant access to the world. You know, and that wasn't there very re until very recently. So there are channels for providing services. You kind of need to, you know, have if you have a great idea, then there's ways of, um, you know, commercializing that, that that previously did not exist. I also mentioned that even though we're with a big company, our group is about 100 people. And uh, you know that's probably a pretty good size for for someone in the you know, data analytics uh, value added type business. Larger than that kind of gets hard to manage. Great, thank you. Any uh, any other final comments from the panel? Okay, good. Great, thanks. Okay, I, I'm just uh, seeing if there's any um, anything in the chat here in terms of Q&A. If not, uh, we'll move to break, but um, I don't see anything yet. I'll just give it a minute there. Oh, here we go. Um, from Denis Amour uh, for Terry. So any idea of potential improvement in forest performance? Example, uh, five day, 80%. Forest. Forecast. For, oh, forecast. Got it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. That, that threw me off because we do use, you know, no, data no. analytics for, for us quite a bit, you know, for extracting information from, from the physical models that we use. So anyway, I, I started forecasting back in the mid 80s. I worked with uh, people like Bill Carter there who's online. And, um, you know, the forecast then was compared to now pretty seat of the pants. You know, you, you only had a general idea of what's happening tomorrow. 
pretty much. Uh, so we're, you know, the science of meteorology through, you know, advances in data access and uh, sensor technology, primarily, you know, satellite-based remote sensing has allowed, you know, the accuracy of forecasting to improve, you know, like at day three and four, you know, for what it used to be at, at day two. So, you know, it's, I'm sure people notice that, particularly if you live in places like Newfoundland, where, um, you know, the, you know, the consensus is that people believe the forecast now quite a lot more than they, they used to. So forecast, you know, I could quantify it um, in the kind of areas that I'm interested in. So for example, uh, sea state prediction is a big, uh, is a big aspect of what, uh, of what we do for our offshore clients. And you can pretty well predict out to three days, so uh, to, you know, within about a meter or two. Thanks, Terry. Any other cues before we go to break? Got a minute there. Okay, well, we'll get lots of chance to talk more in person. It's probably a bit more, a bit more of an effective way to have a conversation when we get back, if there's no more Q&A. So um, thanks for joining the session. So we're gonna take a quick break. Um, everyone gets a chance to get up and stretch the legs and we're gonna reconvene at 2.35 Atlantic. Um, so when you come back, here's, what, here's what's gonna happen. Um, you don't need to do anything other than just accept the prompt uh, when when someone else uh, puts you into a breakout group. So what's going to happen is you're going to click on that button um, and then you get put into a group with five or six other folks. Um, and then a CU facilitator is going to take you through some questions where we're going to try to get the audience talking and, and contributing to this conversation. And then we're all going to pull back in at the end and, and recap that from the various breakout groups. Uh, so thanks for joining us. We're going to take a break and reconvene at 235 Atlantic, which is 305 um, uh, Newfoundland time. And uh, we'll see you in just uh, just a little bit. Okay. Cheers. <laughs>